Ethology Ethology is the scientific and objective study of animal behavior, usually with a focus on behavior under natural conditions, and viewing behavior as an evolutionarily adaptive trait. Behaviorism is a term that also describes the scientific and objective study of animal behavior, usually referring to measured responses to stimuli or trained behavioral responses in a laboratory context without a particular emphasis on evolutionary adaptivity. Many naturalists have studied aspects of animal behavior throughout history. Ethology has its scientific roots in the work of Charles Darwin and of American and German ornithologists of the late 19th and early 20th century, including Charles O. Whitman, Oscar Hainroth, and Wallace Craig. The modern discipline of ethology is generally considered to have begun during the 1930s with the work of Dutch biologists Nicolas Tinbergen and by Austrian biologists Conrad Lorenz and Carl von Frisch, joint awardees of the 1973 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. Ethology is a combination of laboratory and field science, with a strong relation to some other disciplines such as neuroanatomy, ecology and evolutionary biology. Ethologists are typically interested in a behavioral process rather than in a particular animal group, and often study one type of behavior, such as aggression, in a number of unrelated animals. Ethology is a rapidly growing field. Since the dawn of the 21st century, many aspects of animal communication, emotions, culture, learning and sexuality that scientific community long thought and understood have been re-examined, and new conclusions reached. New fields such as neuroethology, have developed. Understanding ethology or animal behavior can be important in animal training. Considering the natural behaviors of different species or breeds enables the trainer to select the individuals best suited to perform the required task. It also enables the trainer to encourage the performance of naturally occurring behaviors and also the discontinuance of undesirable behaviors. The term ethology derives from the Greek language, theta omicron sigma. Ethos meaning character and, logia meaning the study of. The term was first popularized by American myrmecologist, a person who studies ants, William Morton Wheeler in 1902. Because ethology is considered a topic of biology, ethologists have been concerned particularly with the evolution of behavior and its understanding in terms of natural selection. In one sense, the first modern ethologist was Charles Darwin whose 1872 book The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals influenced said many ethologists. He pursued his interest in behavior by encouraging his protege George Romanus, who investigated animal learning and intelligence using an anthropomorphic method, anecdotal cognitivism, that did not gain scientific support. Other early ethologists, such as Charles O. Whitman, Oscar Hainroth, Wallace Craig, and Julian Huxley, instead concentrated on behaviors that can be called instinctive, or natural, in that they occur in all members of a species under specified circumstances. Their beginning for studying the behavior of a new species was to construct an ethogram, a description of the main types of behavior with their frequencies of occurrence. This provided an objective, cumulative database of behavior, which subsequent researchers could check and supplement. Due to the work of Conrad Lawrence and Nico Timbergen, Ethology developed strongly in continental Europe during the years prior to World War II. After the war, Tinbergen moved to the University of Oxford, and ethology became stronger in the UK, with the additional influence of William Thorpe, Robert Hind, and Patrick Bateson at the sub Department of Animal Behavior of the University of Cambridge. In this period, too, ethology began to develop strongly in North America. Lawrence, Tinbergen, and von Frisch were jointly awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1973 for their work of developing ethology. Ethology is now a well-recognized scientific discipline, and has a number of journals covering developments in the subject, such as Animal Behavior, Animal Welfare, Applied Animal Behavior Science, Animal Cognition, Behavior, Behavioral Ecology and Journal of Ethology. In 1972, the International Society for Human Ethology was founded to promote exchange of knowledge and opinions concerning human behavior gained by applying ethological principles and methods and published their journal, the Human Ethology Bulletin. In 2008, in a paper published in the journal Behavior, ethologist Peter Verbeek introduced the term peace ethology as a subdiscipline of human ethology that is concerned with issues of human conflict, conflict resolution, reconciliation, war, peacemaking and peacekeeping behavior. In 1972, the English ethologist John H. Crook distinguished comparative ethology from social ethology, 
and argued that much of the ethology that had existed so far was really comparative ethology, examining animals as individuals, whereas, in the future, ethologists would need to concentrate on the behavior of social groups of animals and the social structure within them. Also in 1970, Robert Ardrey's book The Social Contract, A Personal Inquiry into the Evolutionary Sources of Order and Disorder was published. The book and study investigated animal behavior and then compared human behavior to it as a similar phenomenon. E.O. Wilson's book appeared in 1975, and since that time, the study of behavior has been much more concerned with social aspects. It has also been driven by the stronger, but more sophisticated, Darwinism associated with Wilson. Robert Trivers, and W. D. Hamilton. The related development of behavioral ecology has also helped transform ethology. Furthermore, a substantial rapprochement with comparative psychology has occurred, so the modern scientific study of behavior offers a more or less seamless spectrum of approaches, from animal cognition to more traditional comparative psychology, ethology, sociobiology, and behavioral ecology. Comparative psychology also studies animal behavior but, as opposed to ethology, is construed as a subtopic of psychology rather than as one of biology. Historically, where comparative psychology has included research on animal behavior in the context of what is known about human psychology, ethology involves research on animal behavior in the context of what is known about animal anatomy, physiology, neurobiology, and phylogenetic history. Furthermore, Early comparative psychologists concentrated on the study of learning and tended to research behavior in artificial situations, whereas early ethologists concentrated on behavior in natural situations, tending to describe it as instinctive. The two approaches are complementary rather than competitive, but they do result in different perspectives, and occasionally conflicts of opinion about matters of substance. In addition, for most of the 20th century, comparative psychology developed most strongly in North America while ethology was stronger in Europe. From a practical standpoint, early comparative psychologists concentrated on gaining extensive knowledge of the behavior of very few species. Ethologists were more interested in understanding behavior across a wide range of species to facilitate principled comparisons across taxonomic groups. Ethologists have made much more use of such cross-species comparisons than comparative psychologists have. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines instinct as a largely inheritable and unalterable tendency of an organism to make a complex and specific response to environmental stimuli without involving reason. An important development, associated with the name of Conrad Lorenz though probably due more to his teacher, Oscar Hainroth, was the identification of fixed action patterns. Lorenz popularized these as instinctive responses that would occur reliably in the presence of identifiable stimuli called sign stimuli or releasing stimuli. Fixed action patterns are now considered to be instinctive behavioral sequences that are relatively invariant within the species and they almost inevitably run to completion. One example of a releaser is the beak movements of many bird species performed by newly hatched chicks, which stimulates the mother to regurgitate food for her offspring. Other examples are the classic studies by Tinbergen on the egg retrieval behavior and the effects of a supernormal stimulus on the behavior of gray lackeys. One investigation of this kind was the study of the waggle dance, dance language, in bee communication by Carl von Frisch. Habituation is a simple form of learning and occurs in many animal taxa. It is the process whereby an animal ceases responding to a stimulus. Often, the response is an innate behavior. Essentially, the animal learns not to respond to irrelevant stimuli. For example, prairie dogs, Siamese Ludovicianus give alarm calls when predators approach, causing all individuals in the group to quickly scramble down burrows. When prairie dog towns are located near trails used by humans, giving alarm calls every time a person walks by is expensive in terms of time and energy. Habituation to humans is therefore an important adaptation in this context. Associative learning in animal behavior is any learning process in which a new response becomes associated with a particular stimulus. The first studies of associative learning were made by Russian physiologist Ivan Pavlov, who observed that dogs trained to associate food with the ringing of a bell would salivate on hearing the bell. Imprinting enables the young to discriminate the members of their own species, vital for reproductive success. This important type of learning only takes place in a very limited period of time. Lawrence observed that the young of birds such as geese and chickens followed their mothers spontaneously from almost the first day after they were hatched, 
and he discovered that this response could be imitated by an arbitrary stimulus if the eggs were incubated artificially and the stimulus were presented during a critical period that continued for a few days after hatching. Imitation is an advanced behavior whereby an animal observes and exactly replicates the behavior of another. The National Institutes of Health reported that capuchin monkeys preferred the company of researchers who imitated them to that of researchers who did not. The monkeys not only spent more time with their imitators but also preferred to engage in a simple task with them even when provided with the option of performing the same task with a non-imitator. Imitation has been observed in recent research on chimpanzees. Not only did these chimps copy the actions of another individual, when given a choice, the chimps preferred to imitate the actions of the higher-ranking elder chimpanzee as opposed to the lower-ranking young chimpanzee. There are various ways animals can learn using observational learning but without the process of imitation. One of these is stimulus enhancement in which individuals become interested in an object as a result of observing others interacting with the object. Increased interest in an object can result in object manipulation which allows for new object-related behaviors by trial and error learning. Haggerty, 1909, devised an experiment in which a monkey climbed up the side of a cage, placed its arm into a wooden chute, and pulled a rope in the chute to release food. Another monkey was provided an opportunity to obtain the food after watching a monkey go through this process on four separate occasions. The monkey performed a different method and finally succeeded after trial and error. Another example familiar to some cat and dog owners is the ability of their animals to open doors. The action of humans operating the handle to open the door results in the animals becoming interested in the handle and then by trial and error, they learn to operate the handle and open the door. In local enhancement, a demonstrator attracts an observer's attention to a particular location. Local enhancement has been observed to transmit forage inch information among birds, rats and pigs. The stingless bee, Trigida corvina, uses local enhancement to locate other members of their colony and food resources. A well-documented example of social transmission of a behavior occurred in a group of macaques on Hoshihojima Island, Japan. The macaques lived in the inland forest until the 1960s, when a group of researchers started giving them potatoes on the beach. Soon, they started venturing onto the beach, picking the potatoes from the sand, and cleaning and eating them. About one year later, an individual was observed bringing a potato to Thesi, putting it into the water with one hand, and cleaning it with the other. This behavior was soon expressed by the individuals living in contact with her. When they gave birth, this behavior was also expressed by their young, a form of social transmission. Teaching is a highly specialized aspect of learning in which the teacher, demonstrator, adjusts their behavior to increase the probability of the pupil, observer, achieving the desired end result of the behavior. For example, killer whales are known to intentionally beach themselves to catch pinniped prey. Mother killer whales teach their young to catch pinnipeds by pushing them onto the shore and encouraging them to attack the prey. Because the mother killer whale is altering her behavior to help her offspring learn to catch prey, this is evidence of teaching. Teaching is not limited to mammals. Many insects, for example, have been observed demonstrating various forms of teaching to obtain food. Ants, for example, will guide each other to food sources through a process called tandem running, in which an ant will guide a companion ant to a source of food. It has been suggested that the pupil ant is able to learn this route to obtain food in the future or teach the route to other ants. This behavior of teaching is also exemplified by crows, specifically New Caledonian crows. The adults, whether individual or in families, teach their young adolescent offspring how to construct and utilize tools. For example, pandanus branches are used to extract insects and other larvae from holes within trees. Individual reproduction is the most important phase in the proliferation of individuals or genes within a species. For this reason, there exist complex matin rituals, which can be very complex even if they are often regarded as fixed action patterns. The sticklebacks complex mating ritual studied by Tinbergen, is regarded as a notable example. Often in social life, animals fight for the right to reproduce, as well as social supremacy. A common example of fighting for social and sexual supremacy is the so-called pecking order among poultry. Every time a group of poultry cohabitate for a certain time length, they establish a pecking order. In these groups, one chicken dominates the others and can peck without being pecked. A second chicken can peck all the others except the first, and so on. Higher-level chickens are easily distinguished by their well-cured aspect, as opposed to lower-level chickens. While the pecking order is establishing, frequent and violent fights can happen, 
but once established, it is broken only when other individuals enter the group, in which case the pecking order re-establishes from scratch. Several animal species, including humans, tend to live in groups. Group size is a major aspect of their social environment. Social life is probably a complex and effective survival strategy. It may be regarded as a sort of symbiosis among individuals of the same species. A society is composed of a group of individuals belonging to the same species living within well defined rules on food management, role assignments, and reciprocal dependence. When biologists interested in evolution theory first started examining social behavior, some apparently unanswerable questions arose such as how the birth of sterile castes, like in bees, could be explained through an evolving mechanism that emphasizes the reproductive success of as many individuals as possible, or why, amongst animals living in small groups like squirrels, an individual would risk its own life to save the rest of the group. These behaviors may be examples of altruism. Of course, not all behaviors are altruistic, as indicated by the table below. For example, Revengeful behavior was at one point claimed to have been observed exclusively in Homo sapiens. However, other species have been reported to be vengeful including chimpanzees, as well as anecdotal reports of vengeful camels. Altruistic behavior has been explained by the gene-centered view of evolution. One advantage of group living can be decreased predation. If the number of predator attacks stays the same despite increasing prey group size, each prey may have a reduced risk of predator attacks through the dilution effect. Further, according to the selfish herd theory theory, the fitness benefits associated with group living vary depending on the location of an individual within the group. The theory suggests that conspecifics positioned at the center of a group will reduce the likelihood predations while those at the periphery will become more vulnerable to attack. Additionally, a predator that is confused by a mass of individuals can find it more difficult to single out one target. For this reason, the zebra's stripes offer no only camouflage in a habitat of tall grasses but also the advantage of blending into a herd of other zebras. In groups, prey can also actively reduce their predation risk through more effective defense tactics, or through earlier detection of predators through increased vigilance. Another advantage of group living can be an increased ability to forage for food. Group members may exchange information about food sources between one another, facilitating the process of resource location. Honeybees are a notable example of this, using the waggle dance to communicate the location of flowers to the rest of their hive. Predators also receive benefits from hunting in groups, through using better strategies and being able to take down larger prey. Some disadvantages accompany living in groups. Living in close proximity to other animals can facilitate the transmission of parasites and disease, and groups that are too large may also experience greater competition for resources than mates. Theoretically, Social animals should have optimal group sizes that maximize the benefits and minimize the costs of group living. However, in nature, most groups are stable at slightly larger than optimal sizes. Because it generally benefits an individual to join an optimally sized group, despite slightly decreasing the advantage for all members, groups may continue to increase in size until it is more advantageous to remain alone than to join an overly full group. Nico Tinbergen argued that ethology always needed to include four kinds of explanation in any instance of behavior. These explanations are complementary rather than mutually exclusive. All instances of behavior require an explanation at each of these four levels. For example, the function of eating is to acquire nutrients, which ultimately aids survival and reproduction, but the immediate cause of eating is hunger causation. Hunger and eating are evolutionarily ancient and are found in many species, evolutionary history, and develop early within an organism's lifespan, development. It is easy to confuse such questions, for example, to argue that people eat because they're hungry and not to acquire nutrients, without realizing that their ass and people experience hunger is because it causes them to acquire nutrients. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.